So um, as everybody is ready with uh, and set with technology, um, and many of us already eager to hack away on OpenCast project and Matterhorn, um, we are trying to present you with um, a basic idea and uh, or a few of basic ideas and a concept and um, some sample code that mainly Josh um, put together. Um, we spend a whole week at Zurich uh, looking at things and getting it straight and trying to, to set something up for you. And what we'll do within the next three hours, we'll try to um, get you familiar with all of this. So the objectives of this, um, of this section is uh, that we get a shared understanding of the technical requirements um, everything you, you need to get to know in order to, to build things, to get them running, and to implement your, your pieces of code. Um, the features and benefits of this proof of concept. It's, um, I think it's important to say at this point that it's, um, it's not the idea to, to make um, service design or design the Matterhorn architecture. It's just to show that what kind of technology could be used in order to get everything running. Um, the strengths and weaknesses of said approach, and uh, the next steps, what, what are the possibilities, where can we go from there. And the most exciting part, there's a hands-on session after the theoretical presentation. And um, I think I'll now head over to you. Okay, great. So uh, we're just going to start with the requirements. Um, these were kind of uh, ad hoc. Um, you know, I, I kind of approach this with my understanding of well, what, what's, uh, what's required to get a system like this running. Um, so constraints uh, that, I, that I kind of placed on this proof of concept, um, the functionality that it's aiming to deliver, and then the kinds of developer support it has, um, which it, it, from my perspective is the most important piece of this because without uh, making an, an easy to use, um, quick turnaround time, um, friendly environment for developers, we'll just hobble ourselves. Um, we'll go over the proof of concept. Um, it's based on a few um, bunch of letter acronyms. They're not th only one of them is a three letter acronym, so I guess we're, we're doing well there. Um, and then uh, a little bit of analysis of the proof of concept um, code, and, and then finally the workshop. Um, just, just so that everyone's clear on kind of how, uh, how I'd like, I'd love today, this morning to work is, you know, in this analysis piece, this is kind of my self-analysis of, of how I think um, this, this technology stack measures up. Um, I would really be interested in that being a back and forth dialogue. So um, please feel free to, to chime in on that. Um, and then we'll, we'll get moving with the workshop. All right, so the requirements. Um, we know that we have to uh, deliver under the ECL license, or we're choosing to deliver under the educational community license. Um, and that puts uh, a number of constraints on us in terms of uh, what we can include in our build. Um, is it GPL code? We can't include it, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, next is uh, we know that we need to build uh, using service-oriented architecture. I'll move this down a little bit. I feel like I'm a little loud. Can everyone still hear me? OK. Um, so SOA is an important constraint, and so that's kind of built into the, the technology choices. Um, I put a uh, constraint on myself that um, I felt like it was important around this code to use strong typing, so um, I chose Java. Um, that's, uh, a di I'm sure, very debatable. I'm sure people will say, oh, well, you can have a weak typing and have a distributed project, but it felt like it, kind of the traditional uh, sense is when you've got a big distributed project, strong typing is a, is a benefit. So I put that as a constraint. Um, the deployment topology, we know that we need to uh, be able to support uh, the co-located or one-click install um, runtime and also a distributed employment, uh, deployment. Um, and we want, I really wanted to make sure that the code is agnostic to the deployment topology. So if code is, ends up making a web service call, um, I don't want the, the code to actually know that it has to do that. Um, th there are a lot of pieces that can be distributed, um, and we don't want to have to teach the code every time that you change the deployment topology uh, how to reach its dependencies. Um, and then also, in terms of just developer productivity, uh, I really wanted to make sure that the system could, could build and run completely 
on an offline single laptop. So when you're on the bus, when you're on a plane, train, et cetera. Um, so Java is an example of a strong typing uh, language, where um, uh, whereas JavaScript is a, a weak typing. So JavaScript, you can. This is static and dynamic. And okay. It, it, actually, JavaScript is quite strong in terms of the native weak types. Uh, for languages like C, we're actually weak because they. Ah, yeah. Native. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I think of it more um, along the lines of, like with JavaScript in duck typing, you can kind of pretend an object is a type of another object as long as it behaves the same. Um, whereas in Java, if, even if you have two different objects and they both have the same methods, you can't assign one to the other. Ah, yeah, thank you. So just, um, and then maybe in addition to this, um, most of the errors show up at, at compile time and mm -hmm. not at runtime. Right, right. So the, hmm? ah. Good? Great, thanks. So the original, just to, uh, for the benefit of folks watching the, the recording, uh, the question was uh, difference between strong typing and weak, weak typing, or yes, yeah, strong typing. Weak typing. <coughs> All right, so uh, hmm? uh, or static and dynamic, yeah. Um, so the functionality um, of the proof of concept uh, it needs to be able to provide a uh, media and metadata repository that's kind of core to every other, ser almost every other service that we're going to be providing, some way to uh, to access media and metadata. Um, we need to be able to. Uh, run asynchronous jobs and, uh, and monitor those jobs. Uh, we need to be able to provide RESTful services to front-end clients. Um, and we need, um, we need to be able to uh, run these asynchronous services uh, via WSDL um, or some other standard re remoting technology. I chose WSDL, it's kind of the, the standard. Uh, in terms of developer support, there are two pieces that I thought were really important for developer support. One is to be able to serve static content right from the, the hard drive. So uh, has anyone in here ever worked on a, a big Java project or a big C Sharp project or something where every time you want to change a JavaScript file or an HTML file or an image, you have to actually redeploy an entire backend component? Yeah, OK, so a few people. Uh, it's, it's terrible. It's a terrible experience. I don't recommend it. Um, and so I want to make sure that in the proof of concept, we don't end up there. Um, and then also um, individual components uh, should be reloadable. So if you need to uh, redeploy uh, a new version of some service, you don't have to bring the entire stack down. You can just redeploy your one service. All right, so the, in uh, this proof of concept, uh, the runtime environment is an OSGI container. And OSGI used to stand for something, Open Services Gateway, something or other. And Initiative. Yeah, and I don't think it actually stands for anything anymore. <laughs> I think that they kind of took that off their website. Um, so now it's just a bunch of letters. Um, but basically what it provides is a, a way to do um, what, I, what I've, I've seen termed uh, in-memory service-oriented architecture. So uh, it provides uh, a mechanism to publish services, to discover services, and consume them all inside the JVM. Um, it essentially fixes Java's broken class loaders. And this is a little bit of a, an inflammatory uh, way of, of writing this, this bullet. Um, but I, I think that there's a general consensus that in Java, um, class loading is, is, is broken. Um, and if you're not familiar with class loading, um, I'll give you a little bit of background on this. Um, in Java, you have this concept of classes, um, just like many object-oriented programming languages. And uh, inside of a particular class loader, it's kind of a container for class definitions. So let's say you have a class loader, and uh, you're deploying code into it, and your class loader depends on some version of Xerxes, like uh, XML, parsers, whatever. Um, and then I want to deploy my code into that same class loader, but my code depends on a different version of Xerxes. We have a problem, uh, because those class names are the same, um, but the versions need to be different for our two co um, code bases. So this is a real problem. So um, you, can, you can create multiple class loaders in your, in your runtime, um, but it leads to all kinds of issues. A anyway, OSGI is a stand, uh, standard way of, of fixing this, of providing a very strong um, set of rules uh, in which components need to, to follow those rules. 
Um, and so by following all those rules, you can get around the, the, the broken class loading scheme. Um, OSGI is also a dynamic environment. So what that means is you can actually, inside of a running OSGI container, you can deploy new components, you can take them down, you can refresh them. Um, so you can see how I was thinking this might be a nice fit for SOA where, um, like in yesterday's presentation, Alex said you need to be able to deploy and version uh, services independently for it to truly be SOA. Um, and uh, we're using the Apache Felix uh, OSGI container for this proof of concept. Uh, ideally, we'd, uh, we'd use, um, we'd be agnostic to which, which implementation we use. I just haven't tested it yet on any of the other containers, but it should be possible to run it on any OSGI container. All right, so this is just a snapshot of what you'll see soon um, when you're actually working with, with this code, hopefully. Um, this is the OSGI runtime uh, in, the, in the Felix console. And what I've done at the top there is I've, uh, it's, it's kind of cut off, you can see, but uh, I've listed some of the, um, the running OSGI bundles. So a bundle is the, um, the, the unit of deployment inside of OSGI. So you can see I've got a bunch of different open cast foo uh, <laughs> um, uh, bundles. <coughs> and um, I just typed the help command inside the console and it shows all the th different things that I can do. So some of the things that are more interesting are I can shut down the runtime, I can start new bundles, I can stop bundles, I can uninstall bundles. All the things that I was mentioning earlier, you can do right from the runtime. So a little bit different from like if you're familiar with a Tomcat or, or um, a typical servlet container where it's just a running process, you actually have a console to interact with the, um, the, uh, the runtime. Okay, so yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so I was just wondering if you could relate bundles to web apps a little bit more. Is it like each bundle is similar to a web app running in container like Tomcat, or is it uh, maybe there's a better relation or, or, or metaphor from the class loader? I don't know if you can just kind of, can I set performance requirements on bundles, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. can I change things about bundles, which processors they're running on, and things like this, mm -hmm. or, or what kind of control do I have over bundles? Right. Other than start and stop and refresh, um, you can do. There's a whole configuration management piece, so you can actually have uh, a bundle that requires a certain kind of configuration, and then other bundles that provide those configurations. Um, you can uh, bundles can do eventing between them, that kind of thing. But there's, uh, as far as I know, there's no control over, um, you know, one processor per bundle or anything like that. And do they all run in the same JVM? Yes, inside of OSGI. Um, okay. This is where distributed OSGI comes in. And how um, about security policies? Yeah, there's an entire um, section of the spec that deals with uh, the OSGI spec that deals with security. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, Chris mentioned a really good point. Does this all have to run inside of one JVM? And with the standard OSGI, the answer is yes. So there was an RFC put out um, and the distributed OSGI um, initiative was born. Uh, this is still uh, pre 1.0. Uh, it's not been finalized yet, um, but we're using it and it seems to work okay. Um, there are some limitations we can talk about in a bit. Uh, but basically, uh, it means that components can either be um, local inside the JVM or you can actually move them out to another JVM, which means that you can move it to another physical machine if you, if you so desire. Um, this is really beneficial for our project because we do have such performance um, constraints, uh, high performance. Right, so uh, the default is to use WSDL. Okay. Um, so this actually works nicely with our SOA approach. Um, yeah, uh, the, so the remote uh, services communicate so in WSDL. Um, I'm curious to see there may be other um, transports that are bound. Uh, like I said, this is kind of a new project, so I'm not sure if people are working on new kinds of transports. I would imagine they are. Um, so what this means is that uh, individual components can be load balanced separately. So if we say that our encoder service is a remote service, uh, we, can, we can deploy that encoder service on a dozen machines, put that behind a load balancer, and we now have load balanced um, encoder services 
yet inside of our original OSGI runtime, we just call a, we call the, the component the same as if it were local. Um, so our service lookup is consistent regardless of the topology. One thing that I did want to show is if we can go back to, yeah, to here. Um, you'll notice, I'll go into this in a little bit more detail, but if you notice, uh, for instance, the, I'm going to use the encoder service as kind of a, uh, an example throughout the day. Uh, notice that there are two encoder bundles. It's uh, number 54 and 55 up there. On the left, you'll see the numbers. Uh, so there's an encoder API and an encoder implementation. So the API is just the Java interface. It defines what an encoder service should do. And then I have a particular implementation in this case that does nothing. <laughs> um, but uh, the way that you would, um, you would deploy this to make the OSGI, I'm sorry, the, the encoder <coughs> service remote is you would actually not deploy that implementation there. So you could deploy the implementation elsewhere and tell this OSGI environment to find the implementation, go to this URL. And that could be your load balancer URL. So, yeah. I have question. so <clears throat> I'm just trying to wrap my head around this a little bit. Do you have any idea? It's, it's not just for class definitions that we can use this, but for implementations mm -hmm. as well, right? Mm -hmm. our, yes. our, our instantiations. So uh, I'm trying to think, let's say we have 100 capture boxes out there, mm -hmm. and I want to use OSGI mm -hmm. on each capture box mm -hmm. and then have a distributed OSGI so that you can talk back and forth. Mm -hmm. So instead of using scheduling via RSS or something that's been kind of talked about, maybe instead I can just it's almost like RMI or Corba here. Mm -hmm. I can just do these kind of remote methods mm -hmm. uh, across the network. Do you have any feeling for whether that's a feasible thing? What happens when uh, all of a sudden the network goes down to the one machine and I'm trying to use OSGI to invoke something on it or look up some of its implementation? Right, that's a really good, um, good point. And that's one of the, the, the features of OSGI is that because it is a dynamic environment, the programming model requires that you think about it as a dynamic environment. So um, in a more traditional, I don't know if people are familiar with uh, Spring or, or some of the more now, now traditional um, component models where you kind of wire everything together and you say, okay, well, I depend on this service and my container is going to provide this service and it'll, be, it'll just be there. With OSGI, like you saw earlier, you can stop a service. You can undeploy it. But what happens to all the other ones that depend on it? The programming model actually takes that into account. And so the way that you, um, you write your code in OSGI, you actually can, if you so choose, um, handle, uh, write for conditions where services go away. So you're expecting uh, maybe the repository service to be there, and the repository service can go away at any time because it is a dynamic environment. So your code can choose, OK, well, I want to still be running even though the repository has gone away. And then you need to know well, I'm going to throw these kinds of exceptions or queue things in this way or, or whatnot. Um, but but the, um, the programming model is built no, knowing you have to know that it's a dynamic environment. Is, is there the opportunity to get more metadata about the running processes? Version numbers is something I'm thinking of. So mm -hmm. a distributed update code might be very useful for us. Right. New capture client comes out. We want to push this to all... 100 boxes across the university. Yeah. Oh, well, we just go to our central OSGI thing, mm -hmm. type stop on all of them, type unload, type reload with yeah. this new version, and away we go. Yes. Is this a uh, feasible Absolutely. Thing? And not only is it feasible, you can actually have the old code running with the new code. And so it, let's say your first version was capture client 1.0. You could then deploy a bundle for caption, cl caption client 1.1. And whoever is depending on those can actually say, just like I was saying earlier, I want Xerxes version 2.4, and someone else wants version Xerxes 2.6. Um, you can you can choose when you're when you're wiring your dependencies together what versions you want. So you could actually be running your old capture code and your new capture code at the same time, and whoever is depending on that can can say how they want to wire their their dependencies. I got it. I think it's off. Hello? Hello? Am I on? There you are. Uh, good. Um, as long as they live comfortably in the Java environment, uh, this is great. The moment that they begin to cross boundaries uh, into other kinds of services, 
you know, that may not be Java, that may not be implementing SOAP, et cetera, then you may want to look at other, other protocols for doing that kind of thing. Um, and so if, it depends on how much you know about that capture client. Uh, if it's something you write, then you can use this. If it's something that, you know, you're going to purchase and, and may not support some of these, these standards, then you may be uh, looking at some other way of getting to it. Right, and in this case, because the remoting technology is, is SOAP and WSDL, um, you can either use OS, an OSGI container um, with, with that service definition running um, in, that, in that remote <coughs> container, or you could, it could be something like a Python, as long as it's using the same WSDL. Yeah. I, I guess I had one other question. Can, uh, uh, you showed how you can do this from the console, which is cool. Mm -hmm. So uh, do I also have programmatic control over this? Uh, from within my app, let's say a bundle I just started, mm -hmm. can I shut down other bundles that may conflict or I'm trying to replace or I don't, uh, I, I maybe I'm a virus and I want to <laughs> shut them down. You know, the, the, there's yeah. both kind of pros and cons to this, but sure. I'm just wondering, is it is it something that I can do programmatically as well as uh, manually? I've seen um, some projects from the PAX group, the uh, ops for j and we can, I can show you the URL later. Um, that actually can programmatically create bundles and start them. Um, but I haven't played around with that, so I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so distributed OSGI. So this is a little uh, sample um, that I've put together. Uh, this is the encoder service that I mentioned earlier. On the upper left-hand side, you can see the interface, uh, which defines the encoder service. It's, it has one method, encode, and it returns a status message. And the status message is simply, uh, a, a, it's a complex type of three strings, I think. Um, here we can see status message. Oh, I need a, I don't have a pointer. Um, but it's got a, um, a message, a reference, like what object is this talking about, and a source where, what service generated this message. So this was just kind of a, 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 an idea of maybe what a status message might look like. I've made all this stuff up off the top of my head. I have no idea whether any of these APIs or, or um, service operations are proper, but I just needed something to test with. So don't worry about the actual service implement uh, APIs. They're just something to work with. Uh, but if we look back up, up at the, um, the service definition, I've annotated uh, the service with some of the, um, the Java web services annotations. Um, it's not required, but you can get a little bit more fine-grained control of, over what the WSDL looks like, at least theoretically. Um, so if you're using the OSGI environment, you can simply find the encoder service from the OSGI runtime and use it. And if you happen to uh, be uh, remote, I can't quite reach the, <laughs> the uh, um, if you happen to be remote, um, you can actually uh, reach the encoder service via a URL. And when you publish this service, you actually tell it what URL you want to publish it as. So since it was called the encoder service, I chose slash encoder, and you can see the WSDL there. So it's, it's kind of one of these auto-generated whiz-bang things. Um, but it is, it is nice because it gives us the ability to interact with the, with the same service, either locally via the Java interface or remotely. I've, I've got another, yeah, sorry, please. Josh, I've got another question. That's great. So this is uh, reminding me, and it's all looking very Axis-like or very uh, uh, Tomcat-like. Do you know underneath if it's uh, uh, servlet-based that they're actually running things in, and it, and it happens with the like the J JVM's got this kind of built in now? Or do you have to provide this container environment? Right. Or So uh, o the original versions of OSGI were built for devices, um, small devices, very memory constrained um, devices. And it's only more recently become an enterprise uh, type thing. Um, the, the, HT uh, the HTTP service, which is part of now part of the OSGI spec, uh, it wasn't there originally. So this, is, this was kind of an add-on. And uh, there are multiple implementations of the HTTP service. The one that's in here is Jetty. So there's, a, there's an embedded Jetty that's running. And it's interesting because remember, like I said, this is a dynamic environment. You could shut down the HTTP service. And what happens to our encoder service? Well, it's still available locally, but it's no longer available remotely because it relies on the HTTP service. So this is an example of having to to you know, react to this dynamic environment. If you were to 
start up Jetty again as a service, mm -hmm. would it, how, how does it communicate with, I mean, there's got to be mm -hmm. uh, set up and tear down code mm -hmm. that goes with some of these things. Mm -hmm. how, do, does it automatically kind of recall the encoder service? I'm just yeah. wondering about these yeah. registrations. Yeah, this is great. These are, yeah, so um, there are a lot of ways to do this. Um, the, the simplest way, the kind of the most low level, it requires the most code, but you, you essentially write what are called service trackers. So I write myself a service tracker and I say, when the HTTP service becomes available, register this servlet or mount um, the, this particular set of resources to this URL. Um, so I can kind of programmatically explain how I want my, my URL space to look. Um, and when the service goes away, remove all that stuff. Next time the service comes up, add it back in. And so the service tracker is, is kind of this low level way of of watching what other services become available and go away and allows you um, to programmatically take action when they, when they appear and disappear. Uh, there are some better ways to do this than, than using that low level code because more code is more opportunities for bugs obviously. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit later. There's a, there are a bunch of competing um, ways of doing wiring and that's actually one of the things that I have in my um, what's wrong with the proof of concept is, you know, the best practices are still not fully understood. Um, there's still a lot of disagreement about the be best way to do things. Um, and so we're going to be kind of stuck in that space if we choose to go this way with a lot of options for how to, how to handle service wiring. Okay, uh, the repository. Uh, the repository API, like I said, is a, is a not not designed properly at all. It's not based on any analysis. It was just a, a shot in the dark guess. Uh, but it basically stores arbitrary data and metadata um, inside of um, a, a file system like PATH. Uh, it's con uh, because we're using JCR, it's configurable. Uh, we can store everything in the database if we want to. We can store everything on the file system if we want to. We can store th some things in the database, some things on the file system. We have uh, database independence. We, uh, the default is now using, uh, once I can get uh, the SVN repository back up and running, uh, it will be run, uh, based on Derby, uh, but it's got Postgres and MySQL support and a million other things. It'll run on Oracle. Um, so that's, that's nice. It gives us that flexibility, um, which I think is important because we do have a lot of different schools. I know that Berkeley, we run all of our production systems on Oracle. I don't know, um, I, I think you guys run Postgres, is that right? Postgres and Oracle and MySQL, uh, so we can choose. Okay. So yeah, so we do need to be very flexible in what we support, um, even between just two schools, and we have 13, 14 universities here, so. And it's the same with the JCR repository. It abstracts from the, from the, uh, from the storage you're using. Mm -hmm. Either you have a local disk, if you're a small institution, or you have a SAN, or mm -hmm. you have, what else? Yeah, um, there are a lot of different persistence options. So, so that's, that's, that's a nice uh, benefit of using uh, JCR, in Jackrabbit in particular. Um, uh, it supports clustering and versioning. So uh, at the moment that we do need uh, versioning of objects, it's there, it's available for us. It's not currently exposed in the, um, in, the, in the service operations that I've defined here, but again, those service operations are totally inadequate anyhow. Uh, clustering is, um, so you can run Jackrabbit in a clustered environment, meaning um, let's say we've got this distributed OSGI and you've got 10, 20 different machines each running an OSGI environment. Each of them can have uh, an instance of the repository running. And so if you think of the repository as an in-memory process, uh, which includes um, indexing for searches and all kinds of other stuff, um, they can share the same data store. So that they're talking to the same database. They're... Um, they're talking to, they're, they're connected to the same SAN or file system. It's like the this, yeah, it's, it's like yeah. this is also the, the thing we brought up yesterday with Alex, mm -hmm. so that we don't have to pass on bundles mm -hmm. with every service call, but we can just point to the, to the um, repository. Yeah. And it's available on, on all the machines. Exactly, and we do also don't have, if, um, if the disk, let's say you're storing uh, the large blobs on, on disk, um, the media files and maybe some of the metadata as well. Um, if you've got a SAN so that they're, you're actually connected via fiber, you then don't have to stream these gigabytes of, of, of data over the e Ethernet, for instance. Yeah, the, the Jackrabbit configure. Um, sorry, so the, the question. <laughs> thank you. 
Uh, I was simply asking whether there was already an internal logic in uh, JCR to deal with how the files are served out based upon who, where, when is accessing the, the material. Yeah, so the JCR API, it, this is more about um, Jackrabbit specific, um, so the, this implementation of, of the JCR API. But it, yeah, it, um, it has configurations for, for it's basically an XML configuration where you can tell it, uh, you know, I, I want this to be part of this cluster and here's my node ID and this is where, this is how to mount the file system, that, that kind of stuff. Yeah. JCR is a Java store. Um, I'm sort of wondering if we want to be proper SOA, how does somebody programming in C, Ruby, Python, and so on mm. um, get the data out of there? Right. Actually, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, I mean, there's, two, there's several different things. Um, first, uh, first, I wanted to mention REST. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, there's sort of two different schools of connecting to connecting things today. Uh, one is SOAP and the other one is REST. And um, I think that most modern systems uh, should probably consider both or maybe even include both depending on the circumstance. Uh, REST is much easier if you're going out to something that is not smart enough or sophisticated enough to have full you know, uh, the full stack of WSDL and SOAP and so on. Um, uh, so that's that's one issue. Um, the other, and uh, there, there actually are SOAP uh, implementations for Python you mentioned, mm -hmm. but we have not had good experience with them, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in the case that you're crossing over to something that's running in CPython, uh, a clone system or um, Django or something like that, uh, you might consider not using that, but using a RESTful approach uh, instead. Um, the other thing is that there are actually good implementations of Ruby and, and Java, sorry, uh, Ruby and Python uh, in Java, in JVM land today. Uh, and both of them feature the ability to just import and call uh, Java classes directly. Mm -hmm. uh, really with absolutely no hassle, it's amazing how easy it is. Um, you know, there, there can be minor things in terms of being aware of how the data, data types map to each other, but, but usually that's not a big deal. Um, so the other thing that, that, that may be useful if you uh, have, for example, a Rails application, uh, it can in fact run almost without change, actually without change in most cases, in a JVM environment and start calling Jackrabbit routines mm. right there. Um, so I, I wouldn't be too afraid that this, this locks you into a particular technology. Uh, there's quite a bit of flexibility today. And also Jack, Jack Rabbit um, allows for many technologies, so many ways to access uh, the content, mm -hmm. like uh, REST, like SOAP, mm -hmm. yeah. like uh, WebDAV, mm -hmm. uh, what else? Right, well there's RMI, but that's a Java yeah. specific, yeah. yeah. But the WebDAV is also a very nice kind of way to break out of the Java world. Um, and this is actually, a, um, this is a screenshot right here of uh, yet another way to break out of the Java world. This is a, a, a really thin, um, restful uh, way to access the, the repository API that we wrote over the JCR layer. So uh, upper left-hand corner is uh, just a, an HTML file that I am serving via this OSGI environment. Um, there's a sample bundle. I think it's called sample bundle or something like that. Um, and I've mounted it under slash sample HTML. Um, and you just type in any path you like, upload a file, and tell it to upload it to the, to, uh, to the repository. And then in the second, the middle uh, screenshot, you can see there's a URL. It's a little bit small type. I hope you, you can still see it. Slash rest slash repository slash data. And then the same path that we typed in earlier, and it'll bring up the, the PNG file that I uploaded. So uh, it's a, just a simple RESTful way to get at um, the data. Uh, and it's the same with on the left side, it's actually the upload is via REST as well. So you can either post or get. And then um, the lower part of, the, of that upper HTML document uh, shows a way to just add key value pairs onto that particular path. So I've uploaded this sample.png file to a particular path. I've now attached author Josh to it, and now in the in the bottom uh, screenshot, 
you can see I'm accessing the metadata um, and I want the author from that particular path and it just says the author is Josh. So it's just a really simple way to access um, some very, very lightweight JCR stuff. So did you wrote this app on the left or this is bundled by default with the JCR? I wrote JCR. this. Yeah. Okay, and you use OSGI for exposing it, uh, sorry, distributed OSGI for exposing it to the world? No, this is actually um, a, a, uh, something that I haven't shown you yet. Kay. And it's, I think, the next slide. Uh, okay. um, it's a, it's a REST-based, um, in Java, there's a, there's a new standard, new as of default, called JAXRS, right. JSR 3.11. And so th uh, this uses JAXRS. It's a very simple way to mount RESTful services. Okay, you could use distributed OSGI to make this available via SOAP. So we could just add like uh, some JCR-like bundle that all it does is read and write to the JCR. Mm -hmm. but, but, but your client wouldn't be a, a URL that's like typing to yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So no, we could use SOAP then yes, uh, exactly. to, to do our interaction. This, if we this is also a topic we need, I think we need to discuss. Mm -hmm. So how, right. so in this proof of concept, it's, I think it's a good idea to be able to access resources using REST, so more or less directly, but um, maybe we should not expose the repository um, this way. Maybe we should only, only um, make uh, data available through the services that are using the repository, maybe. And so the, your, your REST-based solution here is actually running through a servlet container of some kind? It, the, oh. the embedded jetty inside of the OSGI environment. Okay. I'm, my mind's just worrying with um, <laughs> uh, single sign-on, yes. authentication, and authorization. Yes. But presumably, that's all ha handled at the jetty le level, and then you could configure this as part of jetty. Mm -hmm. and so yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm familiar with REST, but it's uh, the underlying implementation. Yeah, and, and, and just using the regular regular uh, familiar web mechanisms for authentication and authorization and so on. Um, I think I'm loud enough to, to uh, no, it's, it's, it's recording. recording. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. For posterity. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, no, I mean, that, the, the, there is security there, and, and it's basically the same security that you would have in a, going to any website. Uh, it's not as if you're opening it to the world. The, the single sign-on, um, the way that I would configure this is with a servlet filter that just filters everything, right. and then so everything goes through CAS so or OpenSSO. So yeah, so. exactly. So you would have a bundle that starts up that applies the filter, and you could even, if you wanted, on everything else, rather than watching the, um, the HTTP service, you could have some SSO service. And so nothing starts up, nothing registers any servlet until the SSO service is ready to protect all those resources. So there are ways to do this. I just want to say that, that based upon this, the, the it would be nice if the, the, the information was, was grouped around the bundle as opposed to being divided here I know it's a detail, and, and oh yeah. Uh, but instead of instead of thinking as metadata and, and files, it actually the bundle is the sort of cohesive unit that, mm -hmm. that's there. But uh, I'm sure that, that we're would working on on getting the the bundle. So you're talking about media bundles right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're trying to get it into this, but it's still to do. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. I know that's a detail. So no, it's no problem. So it's good. You know, yeah. there there. I think there are a lot of you know these API things that really need to work be worked out. And you know, like I said earlier. These APIs are all completely wrong. It's just a way to kind of demonstrate some of the technology. Yeah. So, but and it's good. Keep it. Yeah. Uh, when you so when you're using JCR, th it has the concept of. You may correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. It has the concepts of nodes. So you store files in nodes, and you can attach properties to those nodes. And this is what what you're exercising right right yes, now. Exactly. And what what is to do is to match media bundles or whatever uh, structure we may choose to these nodes and and uh, and properties. Any other questions on this? I have a quick question. Yeah. So the Hold on. Just a second. <laughs> uh, so the the properties of the nodes would be the metadata. With with the you can associate a file with a node. Could be. I, I think there's also a set of best practices in place. I don't know if you if you know already. Yeah. This, this is a this practices. is a very um, deep area. <laughs> we, mm. could, we could spend a lot of time on. It did. <laughs> One thing I should say about JCR uh, is, is that it is uh, basically a tree of nodes. Mm -hmm. 
each of which has uh, properties and values of those properties. The property value might be a binary file, which means that you might even have several different binary files associated with a single node. Um, it's, it, it's a very flexible arrangement uh, for doing that. Um, I mean, there, there's still a debate, I guess, going on as to whether entire video files should be stored that way. or, mm -hmm. uh, And that depends partly on the architecture of the repository and, and where it actually stores stuff. Mm -hmm. um, if it stores it in blobs, then we're in trouble. But, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, but, but, you know, assuming that it can be stored on a backing file system of some sort, that's actually a, a pretty good, um, good option. Is it assumed that it's in a file system? Uh, no, nothing's assumed. That's what I was saying earlier. That uh, that the is it assumed <laughs> that it's on a file system? <laughs> 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 that you can actually configure. It, it, we could configure this to be terrible if we wanted to. You know <laughs> that everything is stored inside of MySQL. You know, I which see. is mm -hmm. a terrible choice. Mm -hmm. uh, but you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> You had, al uh, you had already performed any um, performance testing with the GCR, or it's too early to, to think uh, about that? No, no, it's 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 very important. One of the one of the areas that I have on my uh, to do list is is exactly that. Um, I've seen a lot of um, problems on the Jackrabbit list where people have um, misconfigurations, etc. If you configure things properly, there's very little overhead. Um, I've done just very little testing on this, but there's very little overhead for streaming to the data store through JCR. Mm -hmm. um, but I've, I've only done it with, I think, up to a two gigabyte file. Um, we need to get bigger. And we. Can't be that difficult. Sakai did some very extensive performance testing with Jackrabbit before they decided to adopt it. Um, and it was very interesting uh, uh, stuff, if I remember correctly, because they really were trying to model their realistic traffic load. They looked at, at stuff that had come through their content manager in a, in a working uh, Sakai implementation and then tried running that to, through Jackrabbit to see what it looked like. Um, so it may be very interesting to look at that data. Now, of course, the files are smaller than the ones that we're likely to be handling, but it might might give us a start in terms of performance issues. Yeah, I might add here that we have been uh, meeting with uh, with uh, Bertrand Delocato, mm -hmm. um, who's um, working at Day, a company that is uh, mainly developing Jackrabbit. Yeah, Day actually um, initiate Day Software. They're uh, Swiss, right? Exactly. They, um, they actually initiated the whole uh, JSR 170 and 283, which is the next version of the JCR repository. And they uh, are most of the, I, I think most of the committers on, on Jackrabbit. Yeah. And they are highly interested uh, and watching us closely what we are doing with their repository implementation. And uh, I'm sure they are interested in also helping us mm -hmm. if we, should we tackle any, any issues w uh, regarding large files and yeah. When, when you first mentioned Jackrabbit and JCR to me, uh, probably uh, six months ago, uh, I was very cautious about it. I, I, I'm not very sure. Um, I guess the biggest thing is with the huge amount of data, we have lots of issues with having to take it uh, out of local storage mm -hmm. and onto tape, for instance. Mm -hmm. So we actually do keep archival data, mm -hmm. and I know that that's not a user story here, but. Uh, I, I think it, it, the problem remains the same. If you start scaling very, very wide, you get terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data. Mm -hmm. And uh, with versioning issues, this could be a huge issue. Mm -hmm. uh, if we, for instance, consider every processed video to be a version of the original video, mm -hmm. um, I have no idea what this would do uh, on the back end. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I'm very interested to see s uh, how we're going to performance test this and how we're going to play with this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm looking forward to trying to run some uh, test suites to see what we can do to fill up our disks and break them. Yeah. <laughs> and not break them. <laughs> okay, one, one thing that I think is, um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one thing I would mention is, is, is that the Jackrabbit is not the only implementation of JCR. Um, and, you know, probably uh, we don't want to rush in out, out there and look at others, but uh, this has been adopted by a lot of the commercial vendors who have, have big industrial 
uh, strengths repositories. Um, so there might be quite a bit of, what's that? What's big? Are they storing video? Um, video as well as other things, yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, th this may be something that, that one could eventually, if we adopt the, the standard APIs, uh, pop out Jackrabbit and, and put in a big IBM repository or what have you. Hello. Uh, you don't have to do this now, but I, I would like to see some kind of graphic that is showing how, like, where where JCR comes in with, I know it, I understand that it's a re repository, but where Jackrabbit uh, encapsulates that. It just kind of, I need an illustration uh, to try to try to bring all these things together because I mean, I uh, I'm I'm nor normally teased for the amount of uh, uh, letters that I use just in normal conversation, but a lot of these things I'm like hitting Wikipedia for everything. Uh, so if okay. yeah. yeah. Even even after the, okay, I don't feel so bad then. <laughs> if if a simple graphic that says that like JCR here's the repository, this is where data is being stored, here's how it's being retrieved. This this is the methodology that's doing that. Okay, uh, I, I might be able to help if, without a graphic. Just um, so are you familiar with the servlet spec, the Java servlet spec? Can, can I just recommend something? Oh yeah. There's a perfectly good on Java article about this that gives you an introduction to the whole thing. Do you have a picture? Oh yeah. great. Yeah. The, the other way to think about it is um, uh, if you're familiar with, with Java web apps, um, then you, you're probably familiar with the servlet spec, which is, okay, so that won't help you there. <laughs> um, can you continue because I'm familiar with the servlet okay. spec? Okay, so, so, <laughs> yeah. so for those of you who are familiar with the servlet spec but not JCR and Jackrabbit, um, so you can write an application using the servlet spec, and so that this is now a standard Java web application. And now you can deploy that inside of Tomcat, Jetty, JBoss, WebSphere, et cetera, et cetera, right? These are different implementations. Actually, most of them use Tomcat underneath. Uh, but but um, these are different implementations of a servlet container. So you can deploy your web app to any of these. So similarly, if we're writing our application to the JCR spec, we can deploy using Jackrabbit. We can deploy using Oracle Beehive. We can, I, apparently IBM has something. Um, so there are multiple implementations of this repository. I think, uh, Jonathan, you're going to be working on a Fedora implementation, is that right? right? We're beginning to work on a Fedora implementation of JCR. So. Right, so we could deploy our application and under, under the covers, it's actually Fedora that's storing all this stuff for us. But we have that flexibility because we've programmed to a standard API. Um, just one other thing to talk about with uh, the file. If we're using a, a, a file system as our under the covers to store our stuff. Um, I know locally we we um, didn't have very good garbage collection, and we had a we exceeded our inodes on our um, fi file server, yeah. or and so those are things that I think we didn't take into account until quite late in the game, mm -hmm. and so we we should just be hyper aware of that mm -hmm. at, at some point. This is actually a very critical piece of um, at least the Jackrabbit implementation of the JCR API. I might start saying it that way. It's a long Long-winded, but uh, that's what we're talking about. Um, it's very sensitive to this. I think it has kind of a maximum of around 10,000 nodes per ch per uh, per node, child nodes per node. So um, this is not a good solution for a large number of objects that are all flat. So um, I was talking to Ray Davis, one of the developers here, and um, he's talking about storing users inside of JCR, which is actually kind of a weird thing to do, but um, you could you could potentially see someone saying, "Well, a user is content, right?" So users are just users, right? They don't live inside of a tree necessarily, um, but because you can't store a million users, a million objects inside of one node, um, you would have to create some kind of tree structure to store that. So this is this this concept, just like a, a file system, um, it's sensitive to how broad and how deep the the hierarchy is. So we need to be very careful. If we use this hierarchy metaphor inside of the, our, our, our own repository API, we need to be very careful that uh, we structure the hierarchy properly. Particularly if we don't have archive, the concept of archiving for year one. Particularly if we don't have archiving yeah. for year one, yes. Yeah. Any other questions with uh, this slide? Okay, let's move on. 
Uh, okay, so there's also this concept uh, in, inside of the services that I wanted to present. It's more of a, a question to folks. Um, and it's this notion of a monitor, uh, multiple monitoring services. Um, this may not be very clear. We were discussing this last night. And uh, I, ho I hope we can do it justice. Uh, you showing the Java APIs may actually be more clear than, than showing the, the slide, which doesn't say much for the slide. <laughs> uh, um, basically, we, we need to be able to allow clients to make um, calls to these asynchronous, long-running operations. Um, and when we make that request, we need to, I, I, I believe, we need to tell the service that's handling that request, like the encoder is my example. Um, when you're encoding, you need to tell someone when you're 50% finished or 20% finished or you failed or you've completed the encoding job. Um, this may be hours of encoding. Um, so we're not going to have a, a, you know, a, a thread running or a process running that's constantly watching. Um, so this is an asynchronous process that needs to notify someone. Um, this is kind of a, a classic case of under the covers, we could just use JMS or some kind of messaging service. Um, but because we want to define everything in our service contracts so that everything is clear, um, we, need to, we need to expose some kind of a monitoring service, I believe, um, inside of the service operations. So uh, we came up with this concept of a monitoring service and actually having multiple monitoring services um, so that the service implementations don't need to be coupled to some notion of JMS or, or, or uh, sending out events that are, that are not structured. Um, so the idea is, imagine we've got this encoding service, and it's used for multiple reasons, uh, multiple purposes. We have our Matterhorn lecture capture system, and then we might have some, I've mentioned this to, se to several people, we might have some emailing service on campus where an instructor could email uh, a video file to some well-known email address. This is a little contrived, I know, but I'm just trying to think of another use case other than lecture capture. Um, they email the video file up, it gets encoded and emailed back to the professor. And maybe they get status messages every time 10% done, 20% done, 50% done and finished. It's a lot of emails. It's a lot of emails. <laughs> but they may, the this, this, this is an instructor who really wants to know, right? So it's a, it's like I said, it's a contrived use case, but I'm trying to come up with some alternate use for an encoding service. So there would be one implementation of the monitoring service that shoots off emails. Another implementation of the monitoring service that, uh, that f maybe fills out a, uh, a, a dashboard for our lecture capture administrators. Um, and when, when each of those different calls comes into the encoder service, the, the relevant monitoring service is specified. So when the lecture capture calls the encoding service, it says, use my monitoring service. When the, um, so that, that was one approach. I think that you know, a classic pub sub makes sense here but I'm trying to figure out how to fit it into uh, a, a structured web service uh, stack without having to resort to saying, well, we'll just use an EFB. Because that to me feels like we're, we're, we're not defining what we really need inside of our, our service contracts. So this is something I'm very open to um, and I'm interested in your comments. Uh, monitoring versus logging. Mm -hmm. Could we do this kind of thing with log4j and just some custom levels? Or how do you see them being different? Yeah, the, I, the, the problem that I have with just using some, well, log4j could be the implementation, absolutely. But uh, you know, when we're talking about our, our service contracts, I feel like this needs to be explicit. So of course, all of our implementations of our services could just agree on, well, this is how we're gonna log things. We're all gonna throw everything into a database and we'll all just agree on the structure and we'll all agree on, this is how you connect to that database. But that's kind of breaking out of the whole SOA model. It's, it's assuming something under, in the implementation and not expressing that in the, in the service contract. So that's why I'm trying to kind of bring it into the service definition. Do you see potential performance issues? I mean, I, I see, I, I write chatty applications, mm -hmm. actually. They mm -hmm. log a lot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and then use levels appropriately for this. So one of the potential problems is, is if we have a monitoring service that's not local, mm -hmm. that is a distributed service, and let's say the monitoring service is sitting somewhere else, we now have a, a, you know, potentially a really big problem. Mm -hmm. um, 
I guess even if it is local, but the data is going remote via JDBC or you know some other form, whatever the the, the back end of that service is, mm -hmm. um, and networks start to die or things like this, uh, there there could be huge ramifications. Mm -hmm. I just I, I'm thinking more and more like, can we put every capture client if it's written in Java? Can we just use OSGI and mm -hmm. you know try and hook them up in this mm -hmm. giant uh, um, mess? Mm -hmm. Um, and would it work? Mm -hmm. and, and would it be really cool, or would it be a nightmare? <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So, any comments on on versus logging? Uh, um, yeah, would be appreciated. If, if you imagine somebody, who's, uh, one of our administrators over there. Uh, ima imagine somebody who's an administrator and they've just yeah. submitted a, a video and they're being pressured by, you know, an instructor to get it processed really quickly and. Um, and they want to basically watch how it's uh, encoding. Um, I mean, first of all, you don't need to have that status information updated very often. Once every few seconds is probably sufficient, right? And the second is that the messages you're talking about going over the network are teeny. Well, e even in SOAP compared to video files. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, remember that's that's what you know you're you're typically sending is video files and status messages are going to be very small. I mean, the 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 advantage of having a service, you know, underneath whatever transport and and uh, and modular container you have, um, for actually providing that kind of monitoring is very very useful, because of that kind of need for feedback to somebody who's doing something. One, one of the other things, sorry, Jamie, I just want to also uh, yeah. speak to this, is uh, in addition to passing, passing in which monitoring service, we could also specify uh, how chatty you want. So, you know, so I want every, per every time you can make it 1% further in your job to send a message, or just tell me when you're done or when you fail. I, I don't care about anything in between. So that could be another option, too. I just remember from the last time we were having a rather peaceful discussion about messaging um, <laughs> that uh, that the representative from Mellon mentioned uh, another project that had been using uh, Bonjour, Bonjour uh, for the uh, for the so a similar service, and that actually doesn't seem so contrived in this mm. situation. Um, and that would be much more dynamic. So if we had these clustering situations with lots of copies of the same service, that would make our lives a little bit easier, mm. would it not? Th this is the XMPP. Uh, yes. Is that yeah. Bonjour yeah. is? Or is that different? Oh. I remember something about XMPP. It's, 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 it's zero conf. It's zero conf, yes. Ah, oh. yes. Zero conf. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm open to, uh, you know, the implementation details are, are, are wide open. How, how this is done, just, we just need some way to express it. I believe we need some way to express this in our service contracts. One of the nice things about that is that there's also this concept of wide area connections, so it doesn't matter what this, the relationship is with the. I see. So, um, so if we, you're saying if the implementation is in using something like um, multicast, then we can just kind of fire and forget. Um, the problem there is that it's um, it's not reliable. You can't be sure that um, that your your desired client actually picked up the message. Not, not to belabor a point, but I'm just wondering, do you see this messaging service being used for like our debug logging statements even, that low level? Or do you see it being used for something that's going to a person at the end? Is that the, a distinction here that you want to make? Um, well, not guess, necessarily to a person, but yet, yes. It, this, is going, this is a particular functionality reportable. that we need, um, okay. that we know that we need. Like uh, in our dashboards, I think everyone has some kind of a dashboard yep. to, to view what's happening and how, how, how long these how far these asynchronous processes have made it uh, in, their, in their processing. I feel bad. I was just going to say a little thing, and Tobias <laughs> had to run over. Um, I, I think we, we originally called it a reporting service, which I'm not sure if it clarifies it, but reporting you know, job success and, and um, progress. Yeah. If we don't find out that it's 20%, then I think we'll survive, if that's the intention of the service. Mm. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, this is one of those areas where I'm, I'm really excited to actually get started on, on the project so that we can have different proofs of concept, different branches to, to show 
show each other and discuss on list. Um, yeah, this is you know a great area. Um, this is I, I I feel a little bit bad about getting into this because now we are getting into particular APIs and whatnot. Um, and I wanted to try to stay at the technology stack level. But anyway, this was just a kind of a, a burning question that I had, so I threw it in here so we could talk about it. Um, before we move on, should we take a break? Let's let's just uh, do a few more slides. A few more? Yep. Okay. Is there a natural breaking point yep, coming? There up? is. All right, great. <laughs> um, so uh, just to, to get to the, the REST pieces, we, we saw um, the REST access to the um, to the repository. I just wanted to uh, show how, how this works. Uh, basically, uh, we're using JAXRS or JSR 3.11 inside of the proof of concept. Uh, it's, you can see what this looks like here down at the bottom. Um, you just give your class a path. So this is my sample REST service. Um, in our implementation, uh, the way that I've got it set up is you actually have to implement a marker interface, which is a little wonky. I'm not happy about it, um, but that, that's how I've got things set up right now. Um, we can talk about maybe how to fix that a little later. Um, but uh, this path is attached to the sample, or sorry, this class is attached to this slash sample URL. And to register this, each OSGI bundle has what's called an activator. Uh, may have an activator. Uh, you, you can optionally uh, create this, which basically is called when the bundle starts and when the bundle stops. So if you start up your bundle, the activator gets called. And inside of the start method, uh, I create a new service registration. It's just a one-liner where I'm creating a new sample REST service, which is this. And uh, that gets registered with the OSGI service registry. and there's a service listener in my, this uh, JAXRS implementation, which uses REST easy under the covers. It's a JBox product, LGPL, um, which may be an, an issue. We can talk about it. Uh, but basically, it, it uses a service listener, a service tracker, and it sees, oh, there's this new RESTful web service out there that's been published from some other bundle. I don't know where. I don't care. I'll add it into my REST um, registry. And so now, under slash rest slash sample, all of the uh, annotated methods in this class get exposed. And so in this class, you can have um, methods that handle gets, puts, deletes, posts. Um, you can register uh, particular methods to handle sub um, subtrees of, of this URL. So slash sample slash foo could be handled by one method, slash sample slash bar handled by another method. So this handles really all of the HTTP um, concerns underneath a particular URL. Uh, can we go back to the? Sorry. Uh, that's okay. So um, one of the things that I, I forgot to mention is uh, this actually supports all kinds of uh, MIME types as well. So if you want to uh, create JSON, if you want to create XML, if you want to stream a file, um, if you want to just serve out plain old text or HTML, it can handle all of that as well. I have a quick question. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, where's the mic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come in, come in. Uh, great. Thank you. I know, Josh, that you were interested in making the REST calls really transparent in terms of what they do. Mm -hmm. And did you have a strategy in terms of um, documentation for the REST calls? Yeah, there are a couple of ways that we can do this. Um, there are, I've, been, I've got a few ideas. Um, one is that uh, because the, the OSGI service registry is, is where all of these things get registered, we can actually inspect all of the published services. We can look at what URLs they're attached to. And so we could actually have kind of a, I'm almost thinking about it. Are people familiar with PHP info? It's a, it's a way inside of a PHP app to kind of say, this is the system that you're running on. And it blurbs out all kinds of stuff that I have no idea what it is. Anyhow, so I'm, I'm thinking about something similar, although I'll, we'll know what this stuff is that, that it spits out, which it will be all of the different URLs that are attached to what. Um, so that's, that's the, uh, kind of the lowest common denominator of, uh, uh, of it, it having some transparency of what RESTful URLs are actually running in this environment, which will change as bundles come up and come down and register and unregister these uh, JAXRS resources. Um, so, so that'll be a nice feature to have so that you can see what's currently running in, in the runtime. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we can do is if we change this from being a marker interface to being something that actually uh, produces documentation. Sakai has this where I think it, it's, it's gone through a few iterations, but it was called uh, documentable or something along those lines. And it returns some kind of a documentation object, which would spit out a bunch of HTML. 
So that way you could actually call these, and, and I, I did a little proof of concept thing for Sakai, where in this case you would call slash sample question mark doc, and rather than running the, um, the methods in here, it spits out the documentation for that, for that RESTful service. So that's a nice way at runtime, you can see what, what RESTful services exist, you can click on them, you can see what their documentation is without having to go to some, you know, building your Java docs or some wiki that might be out of sync. This is actually the runtime that you're using and you can see the documentation there. What was that JBox library again? Oh, REST Easy. Rest easy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the only, the only thing, uh, the, the only reason I used it is because I, I, I've used it before, but we could probably swap it out for something else if the licenses make sense, that kind of thing, yeah. It's all hidden inside as a implementation detail of the JAXRS OSGI bundle that we've got. So we can, we can hide other jars in there as well. All right, so here's a, an example, um, slash rest slash sample. We're using the, uh, the, the JAXRS, or sorry, the, uh, the URLs and the, the resources that I showed in the last slide. Um, so on the left, we've got an XML example. This is a, uh, the status message that you, we talked about earlier from the encoder service. So it's just spitting out a, a sample status message. Um, so slash XML produces XML in this case, slash HTML produces some HTML, and JSON produces some JSON. So um, it's a nice way to, uh, to be able to serialize the same uh, object in different ways for different representations. Um, this is again one of these things where it's not just a SOAP versus REST thing that we need to, need to maybe, maybe support uh, different, uh, different styles of interaction. But this actually gives us the ability to um, support different um, languages or different representations of the same object. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to link that back to the JCR, which I thought would be really cool if we could do the same thing with the, the various representations of the files when you start talking about distribution, that we can just have, you know, asset slash, um, yeah. Yeah whatever it is that we're talking about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the, um, the implementation of this is um, uses the Jack B, so if we're transforming things into Java objects, we can then transform it, them into what, anything else too. Or if it's XML, we might even be able to pass that directly into the, um, to convert that into JSON for, for clients that prefer that. Um, <coughs> static resources, this is that area where uh, I mentioned if, if you've ever worked on a, a project where you have to redeploy in order to just change your static resources, like images, J JavaScript, uh, HTML, it's terrible. <laughs> um, so this is a, I, I've just included a really, really dirt simple way to serve static content from your file system. Um, this just allows you to make changes on your file system, reload your browser. It's just a much faster way than having to re rebuild and redeploy Java components. Um, so uh, in this, uh, case you can access your content via the static URL slash static slash whatever and in my case I've done the very very stupid thing I've actually um, uh, mounted my home directory <laughs> so um, in my home directory I have an svn.ignore file that I use when I'm when I'm setting up subversion repositories and that's our sub subversion uh, modules and that's what it looks like so because that file's in my home directory, it just gets streamed right out. Um, and again, this is one of these things that um, operates on streams so that you don't have to load the entire object into memory, so it's sufficient. Um, keep going, something? Well, last, last but not least, um, this is the final oh, yeah. slide before the break. Um, in order to get uh, the proof of concept running with real data as soon as possible, we decided on, on importing a few lines of code from Replay mainly the parts that deal with uh, the media bundles. Um, the media bundle handles tracks, metadata, catalogs, and attachments. So there's a whole API around all of this. So we can, we can just easily handle the objects we are dealing with. Um, uh, as we noted earlier in the JCR section, uh, we'll try to map this um, to the JCR um, in a proof of concept way as well. Um, and it also brings in the concept of handles, which uh, gives us an identifier, a unique identifier within the whole system. And if there are no questions on this so the far, handle is the, the handle is an identifier. 
it's not a path, but it can be used in the path, path or as the path within the repository. Um, you don't need, so you, you, in, in replay, we just use it as a path, but it doesn't have to be, or am I not understanding your question? Okay, it's usable as a path. There's a little bit of an overload here. Um, JCR has a, a, a concept of, um, you can add in, a, um, so there are node types, as well as there being a, a hierarchy. Each of the nodes has a particular type. And then types can also have mix-in types. So kind of like in Java where you can add an interface. Um, so one of the mix-in types is referenceable, which gives each node a, a unique identifier. So you could still move nodes within the tree, move them around, and they retain that unique identifier. Um, so that, that way you can refer to things in a persistent way, yet you might want to move something from one uh, sub part of the tree to another because you want to change the authorization of, of who's, who's authorized to see that, or um, mo maybe moving it around in um, some URL space, or for whatever reason. Um, but the handle could actually be this uh, this unique identifier, or vice versa. You could also pass. I, I imagine you could use the handle to resolve to various locations for the media as well, right? So, like for example, if you have something living in the JCR or possibly living in some other file system, mm -hmm. you could have different ways of resolving where the location of that me media lives. So the, yeah, behind the handle is, is the whole thing of the, so the whole handle system, which allows for, for various ways of, of resolving the handle identifier um, to locations. Mm -hmm. And usually this will be the distribution location, so the page where you have the player and everything. But we could also, if we choose to, use it to resolve to, to the JCR repository or to wherever. But right now it's, it's just an identifier, mm -hmm. but it's just to say it's, it's not only an identifier, it's also a handle. It's also useful if we want to share information with each other, or share files with each other, because yeah. this handle system has a prefix on it that indicates mm -hmm. the, basically the host name, more or less. Yeah. And then uh, after that, so uh, it means that we do kind of automatically get a sharing standard, which is quite nice. Yeah. yeah. So using the handles as identifiers allows us, for example, to, to uh, share metadata, but have the distribution remain, uh, let's say, at Berkeley. So the file is at Berkeley, and we share the metadata, and using the handle, we can just add this into the browser line and then we are referred to the correct location to access the, the media. I, n I know everybody wants to go. I see them all crossing their legs. Uh, <laughs> I just, I just, there's a, a couple of uh, terminology pieces that I'm unfamiliar with probably because of my lack of familiarity with replay, but I don't know what a track is and what a metadata catalog is. Is a metadata catalog just like a tuple list of metadata or a collection of metadata, a document of metadata? I'm not, uh, so I don't know if you could just maybe just yeah. introduce what those are. To me. So a replay bundle is, um, so the main characteristic of it is it's file-based, more or less, so it's a, it's a set of files. Um, it's structured in a certain way, so there's a manifest in place, uh, like an index that's pointing to the tracks and the metadata catalogs and the attachments. So. Um, Imagine a recording where you have a presentation like we have right now and a, and a um, video capture. Um, so we have two tracks, which makes two video files, two movie containers, so two real files. So these, these are the tracks. There's a presentation track and there's a presenter track. They're referenced in, in the manifest. Um, and also using the API, you can access these two tracks by name or by flavor like is it the presentation track? Is it the, presenta uh, the presenter? Whatever. Um, same with the metadata catalogs. So right now, um, this code knows about Dublin Core catalogs for static metadata and the MPEG-7 catalogs for dynamic and isochronic metadata. And attachments is the place to store everything else, like, uh, uh, like the PDF document uh, containing the slides or the PowerPoint presentation or any any things that you might have added, uh, adding materials. I'm just wondering how this would be made available, likely to the 
from the JCR, so I see that it's mapped to JCR nodes. So would each attachment be their own node? Would each catalog be its own node? Or m like catalogs would be a node, and then it would kick back a giant XML document of all the catalogs? This is what we, what we don't know yet. Okay. So this is really, this is to do. So we brought in the code, um, and uh, we still t uh, need to do the, the API mm -hmm. on top of the, the JCR repository to put and get these media bundles. And also we don't know how to best store it. Okay, excellent. Yeah, the current, um, the current API is, is just, uh, it's put data, get data, put metadata, get metadata, and you pass it, pass it a path. Yeah. And, and so it, it doesn't even know, it doesn't know anything about what you're putting there. Uh -huh. So we do need to bake in some, we believe we need to bake in some kind of knowledge of this. Um, like a higher level, bundle. a higher level API that, yeah. that knows how to deal with the data we are, we are working on which is media files, metadata files. Uh, is it possible to define somehow a um, handle that identifies um, a group of, of those items? Something like uh, imagine a digital object formed with tracks, metadata, and attachments, and each of those items has his handle, but you can define a handle for a group of, of, of like items. A, like uh, a lecture series? Yeah, no, like um, a lecture series could be built with uh, uh, each lecture will, will be a, those type of digital object. The digital object inside has the track, the metadata, and so on. So that group, will, will you can define a handle for a, a group of handles or so it, hands, uh, it, it has, has no sense? Or we, d we do this in, in Replay, we do this. We have this concept of groups, but um, it's not yet built in or thought of um, within uh, Matterhorn. Mm. I'm sure we need this concept of groups, Certainly. but there's, mm. there's no, yeah. there have been no thoughts on yeah. how to but realize I, it. I, I think the Vicente is saying um, that we need, <coughs> a, he's asking if the media bundle itself could have a yeah. handle, and then a track inside of the media bundle could have a oh. handle as well? Yeah, I, no, I, my question is, uh, I, if I understand correctly, you could have a handle for a track, a handle for a, for a metadata, or no, a handle for... You have a no. handle for a media bundle, ah, okay. and there's an identifier within the bundle for every element. So every track yeah. has a unique identifier within the bundle. Uh, so what I am calling a digital object is a media handle. Ex it's a, a, media a media bundle. bundle exactly. Media bundle. exactly. Oh, okay. This is the unit we are dealing with. Mm -hmm. So okay. because... For example, the, the encoder service um, might only need access to the track mm -hmm. in, o in order to encode it, but it might also be using the, the metadata um, sure. document, the MPEG-7, to get to the, to mm -hmm. the um, chapters, to mm -hmm. be able to add chapter marks um, mm -hmm. to the encoded uh, product. So we, yeah. I think we, we should be referencing media bundles. To the unit. Yeah. Okay, great. Can I just... Sorry, just let me. Uh, yesterday we were talking, uh, Chris. I think we, we were talking at the table and John um, about where in the current replay in, in implementation. So, as as I understand it right now, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, um, the the um, structural aspect of these bundles, the the grouping of them, is something that's essentially determined at scheduling time. That by by saying that this recording will be grouped with this course, mm -hmm. that's where the material goes. Um, could we not also consider the possibility of moving that to queries at the end so we can dynamically generate them? So that way we don't have a database specific, I mean, it's not per se necessary for JCR to know that these bundles, these whatever they are here, have any sort of inherent grouping beyond their internal metadata status. And that, I mean, I found with the systems that we work with that it's much nicer to be able to say, well, actually, I really like it if if we use this as our basis for, mm -hmm, for exactly. organization instead. And then that way, um, this decision-making process is deferred till later on. That's, that's uh, already the case. So, so the repository doesn't know anything about the grouping. It's, so it's part of the metadata of each, of each uh, media bundle um, saying where, where it belongs to. So you can do queries on, on all of, or you should be able to make queries on all of the metadata. And one of these fields might be the is part of field, that, which is part of the Dublin Core uh, definition. And if you fill in the is part of, then you have a grouping uh, option. And you can also um, group on, on uh, I don't know, on uh, lecturer or on lecturer location or subject, whatever. 
So this it's not fixed or baked in yet. Yeah, and I, I could even see, I don't know if there is a use case for this, but uh, a media bundle doesn't necessarily have to all live inside of the same path. So, you know, you could have tracks scattered all over, potentially, I don't know if this is good or bad, but scattered all over the repository, and mm -hmm. but the definition of the media bundle yeah. points to all of those different places. Yeah. That, that, exactly. could, that could happen. I, I, I don't know. This. This. Like you could store the binary data on one machine yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 and it's and it's even possible to 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 sort of split the JCR repository into into separate areas, mm -hmm. where you could uh, possibly map one area to a file system and the other area to a database. So looking at metadata catalogs and and uh, files. There's also uh, uh, things called workspaces, which allow you to actually Th that's have alternative what I was talking views referring of, to. Thank you. of the same structure. I'm, I'm a little confused still about the relationship between handles and referenceable nodes. Um, in particular, my understanding, and I could be wrong, is that referenceable nodes each have UUIDs in particular. Mm -hmm. um, are, are handles UUIDs, or how, how are those related? So um, two answers to this. So first of all, Handles have been brought in because they are integral part of media bundles right now, uh -huh. which must not remain like this. I think it's a good idea, but it's it's not. So we, if we don't need the handles, then we can put away with them. If we have another way of identifying the okay. media bundles, yeah. so this, so we don't mm -hmm. we don't really need it. It's just like now it's part of the code, and I, we just moved in everything that belongs to to media bundles. I understand. Uh, the second question. So the second answer is. Uh, a handle consists of a prefix, which identifies the storage location, like the host. It's mm -hmm. uh, so the, the prefix says it's located at at Berkeley, it's located at ETH, it's located wherever. And the second part is the identifier within this domain, which could be um, a UUID, it could be a name like Jonathan, it could be anything, as long as it's unique within your domain. Mm -hmm. So these are the two parts of a handle. Okay. So I would suggest that we do. I, I know that John had a question oh, okay. as well. I'm sorry. Just that. Think you're on. It's working. Am I on? Okay. Just that uh, your media bundle itself has a tree structure, right? Like a yeah. like a jar. So it seems like there's a natural mapping to JCR just because of the structure. Yeah, I would say that. Another, another quick question. Uh, if I understand correctly, uh, in the GCR environment, you can split uh, between different machines, different uh, parts of, of the storage. You could also do that with the file system. You could pa have the fi file system spread, okay? And uh, so in that environment, if you move physically the media of, of a bundle from one to other, I understand that the handle remains uh, still. It's it, it's it's uh, oh. it yeah. yeah. The persists. Persists. So persists, the handle yeah. the handle is uh, is updated. So if you are moving the da the data, mm -hmm. you need to update the handle. So there's a, uh -huh. a handle database, a resolve. <laughs> it's called a resolver mm -hmm. um, behind all this, and you're basically asking the resolver for the location of the things that are referenced by this handle. So it will return, usually it will return a URL to some web page. Mm -hmm. It could also um, return a, a file URL. It could return <coughs> just something. But um, So the handle can change if you move the part of the media? The handle is not changed, but the storage location that mm -hmm. is, that is um, um, referred by this handle yep. can change. So you can update the metadata that is attached mm -hmm. to the handle. But you can access to that ha handle giving to, to that bundle, giving that handle to the GCR, and you don't have to worry about where the storage is. Exactly, as long as you're updating the handle, if you're, so when you're moving the data around, mm -hmm. you should be updating the storage location. And if you do that, you can always ask the handle resolver, where is this thing? Yeah, you're mm -hmm. not handling the handle ID, you're not, up, you're not updating the handle ID, you're updating the no. location. Right. Exactly. And actually, this could actually fit in nicely with the referenceable uh, um, part of JCR, where you have a, a persistent uh, identifier on the node, even though the node can move around. Mm -hmm. um, and so if the resolver resolved to the UUID rather than the path, 
now you never need to update the um, the resolver ever again. Yep. So you can still move things around inside of JCR, mm -hmm. and the handle resolver can still find it. Yep. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Great. Oh. Okay. Okay. Great. Adam's gonna wait. Then we're gonna take a ten minute break. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Can folks take their seats and we can get started again? It was a little bit longer than 10 minutes, but so be it. You're so generous. Oh, that's how we are. Yeah. You know us. <laughs> you guys just give and give. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I just want to do a quick analysis of the, um, the proof of concept code um, that we've got running that I've been showing you guys uh, some of the features of. Did you turn on? Hmm? Did you turn on? Yeah. Good. Uh, so there's a bunch that's missing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the service operations that I've got defined are almost certainly wrong, um, but that wasn't really the point of, of showing the proof of concept. Um, the test coverage is currently incomplete. Um, one of the things that uh, Tobias is going to talk about soon uh, in terms of our development methodology, uh, testing is very central to that. Um, and the, the current test cases are, are all unit tests, but we'd like to have integration tests that actually launch the OSGI environment, hopefully in a lightweight way. Um, the service wiring practices are, are be best practices are unknown. So we mentioned this earlier, how services can come and go, and uh, and how you wire them together can can require a lot of code, and more code means more bug potentials, um, and because it's all asynchronous and dynamic, it, it can be hard to track down. Um, so we're trying to figure out the best practices for uh, how to wire services together in a way that doesn't require a lot of code, but still allows for that dynamicity, if that's a word. Um, and the requirements are, are currently unknown. We've got a lot of lists of you know, what we need to support in terms of features, but how that all translates into the services and how the, the service needs uh, translate down into the non-functional requir requirements is still kind of an open question. Um, uh, the monitoring system is homegrown. Uh, there might be something in WS Eventing that we can take advantage of um, that breaks us out of being able to use it in the j inside of the Java uh, environment. So that's still unclear. Um, it's not implemented yet, and uh, folks haven't vetted it yet. So um, this is still one of those. That's why I bring, brought it up earlier as a question. Of how do we get this PubSub concept into our service contracts? Thank you. No problem. Um, so what's next? Uh, I would love to see if anyone has time, uh, an alternative. Um, Suggestion, uh, maybe grid computing, that's a possibility for distributing um, the, the, uh, the load of, of these services across a grid. Um, I'm totally open to uh, alternatives. I think the distributed OSGI environment is good. I think it makes sense for us. Um, but there may be alternative uh, environments that work for us as well. So if people do want to put together a proof of concept, um, we can set up room in the new subversion repository on, on source.opencastproject.org, which has just got up and running within the last day or so. Um, and we can, we can set that up as well. Um, if we do do that, um, we need to really make sure that we've got, um, we've got it available for the developer community to take a look at by June 1st so that we can get off and, and running on July 1st. But my whole um, goal in doing this, uh, this work was to be able to get something to you guys early Make sure everyone is on the, on the same page. Everyone's kind of got buy-in. They say, yeah, I can work with this. I like this environment. Um, and, and then be ready to start uh, running on, on July 1st when the grant starts. So that's my hope. And if this is the proof of concept, is, is that piece that everyone can coalesce around, that's great. If there's something else that someone wants to develop, um, we're open to that too. I think that. That was it for now. That was it. So we have two. Um, well, let's move on to uh, Tobias's presentation on developer practices. And then we've got some options for where to go from there. Josh, I just wanted to say with regards to grid computing that we have a small set of older machines that we can make available for the Great, thank you.
Ah, so uh, the microphone issue. So Chris just offered, they've got a bunch of older machines that they can run grids on. So if people want to do some work on grid computing, um, talk to Chris, he can well, set you up. Not X grid, correct. Huh. Yeah, there there are some uh, really nice open source uh, Java uh, yeah. grid platforms now. I'll be ready in a second. Keep talking, Josh. Uh, so, <laughs> so um, one of the things with this project is uh, Adam mentioned the other day uh, this kind of duality of we're we're hopefully this grant funded project of a bunch of universities. Um, and we're also trying to be this open source community where anyone can contribute. And so that sets up some uh, interesting problems in terms of how we do actually do our development. And uh, so one of the things that um, we, we want to make sure that we're all on the same page on is, is our kind of uh, policies and procedures for doing development work. So uh, Tobias is going to talk about that now. Okay. We'll start off with, uh, with uh, looking at the tools we were using to get this uh, whole technology stack running. Um, first of all, and this is, was mainly added for Adam, um, there are management tools. <laughs> um, so w I learned that you had a look on Monday already at uh, Jira and Confluence, and also maybe SVN, maybe not. Uh, which one of the developers is not familiar with SVN? This is great news. <laughs> Good. So uh, there, um, as Josh already said, we had uh, our um, project management environment, environment set up uh, during the last two weeks. Uh, you can see all the URLs up there. They will be posted to the list um, shortly. Um, there are a few things uh, that still need to be configured, but it's all basically set up and more or less running. Yes. Quick question on the subgroup. Go ahead. Can you just describe, or, 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 or I guess make clear for me, the difference between these tools and the SourceForge project that started? Was the SourceForge just to play with, and this is for exactly. real kind of thing? Or? So, yeah, this is where um, I'm going to use my Jedi mind powers. To, there is no SourceForge. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's not the repository you're looking for. <laughs> um, so yeah, we've, we've moved everything from SourceForge onto this source.opencastproject.org. Um, we're still trying, there, as of this morning, I couldn't commit yet. And so there, there are some, some issues that we're still working out, but um, let's, let's try to just you know, center on these. That I've, I've, um, I, I opened up SourceForge, you know, this site a year ago or so, just as a place to play. But now that we have these, we should, we should try to focus on that. So in terms of tools, uh, of development tools, and we are now getting kind of hardcore. Um, all you need is Maven, and you might need Eclipse, or you might need IntelliJ, or JBuilder, or whatever uh, you're familiar with. Um, the main uh, code structure that um, Josh set up uh, uses Maven, uh, a Maven structure, so you are easily able to, to uh, import this thing into e either Eclipse or IntelliJ and whatnot. Anybody that is not familiar with Maven? Can I hand over, Josh, because yeah, you're, you're much better at it? Yeah, so, absolutely. So, um, so who, is anyone who's not familiar with Maven familiar with Ant? Anyone not familiar with Ant either? Okay, so um, back in the day, <laughs> uh, most people you used... For, you forgot uh, to ask about Make. Uh, make, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, so, no, no. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Ant, I think, was originally developed as a response to make. It's, uh, it's essentially an XML file that describes how to build the project. And you can, you can tell it, uh, you can configure the class path. So, um, you know, on my file system, I have these jars that I'm depending on. And, and you, can, you can pass all this stuff in and configure it inside of Ant. And it's very flexible, and it can do a million in, in one thing. So it's got all these conditionals. It's very fun. Um, the problem is that every different project structured their code base in a different way, and they wrote an Ant script custom to how they liked to work. And so uh, when you tried to take multiple projects and, and bring them together, the different build systems, and so now you have to make some new build system that calls the other build systems, and it, it, became very, it can become very confusing. 
Um, also, some of the things that were, were missing were, um, let's say, for instance, uh, you had a dependency on something like Hibernate. I don't know if people are familiar with Hibernate. It's an object relational database mapping tool. Um, it also, Hibernate happens to have dependencies on like 14 different jars. So now if you're going to depend on Hibernate in your project, you need to go out and hunt for all those different transitive dependencies and include those in your ant build. Um, so Maven came along and it said, well, there's a way that we can do this to kind of structure things by convention. It's kind of convention over code. So make sure that your, your, your source files are here, your resource files that need to be included in your jars are here, um, describe your dependencies here, and we'll go out and we'll find all of your transitive dependencies for you. So it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very nice build system. Um, it kind of uh, forces you to consider uh, how your dependencies uh, align. So uh, it keeps you from having cyclic dependencies, which can, can, can happen inside of, um, inside of an ant build. So it's just a, it's a nice structured way to, to do builds, long story short. Can you just build Java? I would say I don't yes. Know. I would yeah, say yes. I actually can build other things, but I've seen it used that way. Oh. Uh, oh, okay. Mm. Yeah, you can actually uh, break out of Maven um, to go to Ant as well. So from a Maven um, installer, you can you can include Ant stuff as well. And I think Ant has Ant can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, for those not really familiar with Maven, there's a there's a great tutorial online. Uh, we might be sending out the, the URL to it. There's, it's a very good read, um, and it's I think it's important to get a, a basic idea about these structure requirements that Josh was talking about, uh, so to easily understand what's all about. I, I th uh, just to let you guys know, the agenda page that we've been referring to online, hopefully we'll have all the pertinent links there. Um, all the documents and uh, pertinent links that we've been discussing throughout this week, we hope to have those posted to our agenda page on opencastproject.org. Thank you, Adam. So now to um, a difficult subject, but also to, a, to, I guess, to a more or less open discussion. Um, we were thinking about who should be committing code, who should have the right to commit code, what should the code look like that, that is committed? Um, do we impose any restriction, uh, any requirements on the code? Should it pass any tests? Should it um, apply to any formatting? Should it, uh, oh, you can, should it have a, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so what, what we are proposing right now is um, we split up the team into these, into these sections we have at the wall. And we would propose that there's one committer on every team in the beginning. So one committer has the lead and he's free to add other committers if he thinks these committers know how to do it correctly and, and uh, how to deal with all the requirements. The point behind all this is um, we are an open source project. Um, so in theory, everybody should be able to commit. On the other hand, you just jump in. <laughs> on the other hand, um, we have um, a, short, a very short timeline, uh, so we cannot just go for everything and let everyone do whatever he or she wants. So I think it's it's a good idea to uh, to manage um, commits. Yeah, from from my experience, each different open source project has different um, uh, almost a different culture. So you know, in some some cultures, anyone can commit anything, and the reviews ha code reviews would happen after the code is already in the repository. Other uh, groups are, are more um, particular and they require a code review before code gets into the repository. So we're just proposing that um, because we want, we want to encourage people to submit patches, to um, add features, uh, to, to getting involved in the project, uh, but we want to make sure that that code uh, aligns with um, our roadmap because we do have um, commitments to our universities, to Mellon, et cetera, um, that we need to, to keep in mind. So, Rather than just allowing anyone to commit anything, we'll keep those um, keep the control a little bit tighter and keep our roadmap and stay focused on delivering the products that we need to deliver um, and allow people to contribute new features, bug fixes, et cetera, uh, via patches. Mm -hmm. um, and once people have, have shown that they really understand the culture and what's required uh, to be a committer, then and they've, and they've demonstrated that via sending in patches that 
look good and, and match with our, our roadmap, then they, can, they become committers as well. So the basic idea behind this is to, to relieve the, the um, sub-project managers from, um, well, from, from needing to check out everything and testing everything and looking at every, each and every patch mm -hmm. or, or commit mm -hmm. and uh, fix, uh, I don't know, documentation, lack of documentation and fix uh, the missing of unit tests and everything. So, um, so what we propose is um, there should be no commits to, to the SVN repository that don't um, fulfill a certain set of requirements. And what we were thinking about in the first place are the, I think there are the basic requirements for, for SVN commits mm -hmm. anyway. So that unit tests need to be in place, first of all, and they need to, to uh, succeed. Mm -hmm. So no check-ins if the tests are not succeeding or if the tests are failing. Um, we would like to enforce a certain kind of uh, code formatting because we are an agile team. Everybody owns the code, so everybody should be able to read each other's code. And this is only possible if not everybody applies his or her own coding style. Um, and last but not least, but also important, uh, no commits without license header. And uh, fortunately, I'm coming to you, Adam. Fortunately, uh, Maven, the Maven tools we are using, um, are easily able to, to test all these requirements. So also for you, it's very easy to test if you are able to commit the changes you just made. Um, right, the build will actually fail if you yeah. aren't following the coding styles, if you've got missing license headers, if you have failing JUnit tests. So it's very obvious that before you, before you commit, run a build and if the build fails, then you're not ready to commit. Oh, and it, yeah, it might seem as a, as a hurdle, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, it's good for all of us because it, it gets so frustrating if you see your team member committing things that, that just don't work, that make your system break, that you cannot read because it's, it's bad formatted. Yeah. The, the other reason, the, um, the code formatting thing might seem a little bit um, uh, draconian. Uh, but when you have people submitting patches, uh, if the patches are, are enormous because uh, somebody has made some big code formatting changes, um, it can be really, it's, it's ridiculous. You can ha have this huge patch that looks like it's a big change, but really it's just one line change, but it's a big patch because somebody went through and changed tabs to spaces or, or vice versa. So it, it makes the, the uh, merging in patches much easier if the code formatting is all consistent. So you were first, I guess. <coughs> so I don't know if all of the developers here are familiar with test-driven development and if that's a practice, if that's a methodology or practice that you want to instill Definitely. and uh, the concept of continuous inter integration. Um, so I'm sure you guys might be touching on that later anyway. But Yeah, we're, well, we're, we're trying to move on because we know that we need to get to the front end stuff and, the, um, yeah. and the, <laughs> hopefully the workshop as well to actually get to run but that was definitely okay. a question we, we, we missed out. So is everyone is everyone familiar with unit testing? Our group doesn't do it. Mm. Yeah. So so who is not familiar with unit testing? We're like I know what it is. Mm. Yeah. We just don't practice it. Do yeah, so, so yeah, you know, I can I can talk about a little bit about it. I mean unit testing is um, you're testing individual units of code. So um, if you've got a method that does something, you've got a test that tests that um, it does what you would expect. So uh, the right kinds of exceptions are thrown, the right kinds of constraints uh, exist. And just basically, um, test-driven development, I don't know if I want to go there, because in test-driven development, you actually write the tests before you write the, the, the implementation. Um, and I don't want to be that draconian to say how you have to work. But if you're committing code, there needs to be tests that, um, that test do two things. They one, they, they test whether the code works sometime, <laughs> and uh, depending on how rigorous your tests are. And two, they explain how to use the code. Um, so it's, it's like having a client for whatever kind of services that you're, that you're building all the time. Um, if you just build a service without a client, you, can, you don't know that it works properly, mm -hmm. and you don't know how to use it. So when I look at a new project and I'm trying to figure out how do I get involved with this, how do I, how do I see where all this stuff works, you go to the tests first, because the tests describe this is how you would use this particular class or this particular service. Mm -hmm. And maybe let me emphasize why, why it's uh, important, especially for us, mm -hmm. to do these tests. Um, because we are split up and because um, P 
people are spread all over the world in different to different uh, time zones. Uh, imagine I, I would upload or commit some patch mm -hmm. <laughs> to a, a central component without doing testing, or without, without providing unit tests. I would commit, Josh would get up a few hours later, um, check out, run everything, and it's just not working because I didn't do the testing properly. Mm -hmm. So Josh has to wait a, a whole day until I get up again and I could fix it and, and we will, we will uh, produce a lot of frustration mm -hmm. and lose a lot of time. So I think especially for us as a distributed team and uh, spread over various time zones, it's very important to do proper test cases. Um, so keep, with keep that to moving down, yeah. With regards to this test-driven programming, we're just on the opposite side. We're extremely efficient with the brown paper back programming paradigm. But um, what I wanted to ask is, um, um, besides uh, subversion, is um, should we provide like an option of um, using this code through some distributed source code management system like Git or Mercurial or something right. like this? Yeah, I had posted that to the list a while back um, about using Git and there didn't seem to be a lot of excitement about it, so I just kind of dropped it. Um, I know that it, the Sakai folks are using it extensively. I, I, haven't, um, I haven't really gotten into it as much as other people have, but some people love Git. Um, it's a it's a nice way to collaborate on branches. I think um, that if you're if you're really trying to experiment and trying to make changes to to some component, I think it's a it's a good way to do it because you can have multiple people sharing their work that way. Um, it, so. There's actually a Git to subversion bridge. So mm -hmm. you know, you right. So yeah. So people can work in Git and then push their changes up into subversion as well. So that's an option for people too. So um, I mean, um, uh, committing code is, is is just one thing. Have you thought about um, how many different uh, trunk versions we will have, or um, four eyes are better than two eyes? Checking the code all the time. So if some some like like I I commit code that is needed for the engagement phase, um, when when is it uh, sure that uh, code moves from a trunk to to the stable version and 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 uh, yeah, we haven't really talked about release management okay, much at all. Okay, because this is really important. Because yeah. yeah, yeah, and I, this is part of something that I think the project managers are going to have to coordinate. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also up to discussion on the list, I guess. Yeah. As as is all of this that we are um, proposing here. Right, right. The the one thing that I will say is, if you look, take a look at the source, the way that the source is structured right now, I can only speak technically. I, I can't speak of kind of you know the policy of how we're going to manage the releases, but. Um, we can, you can we can make branches and tags of each of the individual components as well, and then build distributions from those. So, so that's an option. Um, I'm just wondering if JUnit provides a format for documenting each test that we would follow, like a, a way of documenting. Yeah. Okay. Well, sort of. I mean, the thing is that you can always, you know, not document or <laughs> whatever. Um, Two points. One is that, that it seems to me, at the very least, um, I would expect there to be Java code, uh, JavaScript code, and perhaps ActionScript code. Um, are, are you thinking of, of basically applying unit testing and code formatting standards to those other languages as well? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, there's, um, there's, I know that Eli can, can speak to this uh, as well, but there are plenty of JavaScript uh, testing frameworks as well. Yeah, I use one yeah, Fluid has had really good luck with the um, the the set of tests that have come out of the jQuery community, and we've actually built some extensions to those that we call JQ Unit, and those are available from the Fluid site. So we've basically built some extensions on top of that that make it um, even easier to use. Right. It also um, you'll notice that your JavaScript, the way you write your JavaScript, will change if you need to test it because you really need to kind of build the hooks into your code in order to be able to make it testable. But those same hooks make for much more modular JavaScript code and much better JavaScript code. So you can learn all those lessons from the Fluid community. We, we learned them painfully. Uh, the other thing is if you've never tried unit testing, it's completely addicting and one of my favorite things to do. I'm serious. <laughs> Definitely try it.
just just two quick uh, things here. One, I think, I mean, as we get into this, uh, being from a research group, we often try and hack our stuff together, proof of concept, and then it's throwaway. So we're going to need, you know, some help on uh, size of patches, how often we should be committing, how often, we, how big our unit tests should be. I mean, I can see a, a naive approach being a week long of building unit tests to mm. test a trivial method. Um, <laughs> but I'm wondering if... Um, if you've considered any uh, code auditing as well, and I'm thinking about this from the accessibility standpoint as well as from like the project as a whole, like when we get a chance to make sure that everything's making sense across, and also best practices for testing servlets, uh, sorry, not servlets, services, um, especially uh, anything that's backed by WSDL. Do we just test it as if it were a method, or do we? is there something else that we have to glom onto that as well? Yeah. These are great questions. I think um, I think that there are different levels of, of testing. So what we're saying for this is that unit tests are the bare minimum. You can't even commit code until it's unit tested. Um, on top of that, um, what I'm hoping to do is get uh, QA support for helping us write um, more functional tests that can actually test uh, the, the full container running, uh, you know, doing uh, web service operations against against services from you know, so from the, something even from Perl or that you could run from the command line uh, so that we can both get integration testing but then also performance testing from the full stack. So these are, these are things that um, we haven't started yet but um, what I'm hoping is, you know, if, if we have a lot of people and we, we have a lot to do as well but if we can stay um, focused on, on, like uh, Alex was saying yesterday, on, you know, kind of stripes of functionality um, I'm hoping that we can, uh, Tobias and I can kind of work on, on those kinds of levels as well to, to help make sure that from the beginning we have performance testing because doing all the performance testing at the end, for instance, you don't know what, uh, when you make changes, you don't know whether or not you've just killed the performance or not. So to get those kinds of benchmarks from the beginning I think is really important. So there are a lot of different levels of testing, um, but I think what we're, we're suggesting is at a minimum Start, yeah. start with the J unit. This yeah. is definitely the minimum that we're that we're showing here. Yeah, and I think it would be important that everybody agrees to some s minimal set. Yeah, yeah. Smokers. Um, yeah, just just one one more thing because we're using SOA or we're trying to use SOA in web web service architecture, uh, and I think we will really need a lot of simulation. Because um, when when we do testing, testing uh, external web services, and these services are not really there at the moment, then it's uh, I don't know it's uh, it's 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 really uh, overkill to simulate tests and simulate um, functionality that's not really in the system. But um, I'm not sure if you if you get me right here um, when it when it comes to user interfaces again. So. I in um, I have to um, simulate uh, web services out of your system, mm -hmm. and I write a lot of tests for that. And in the end, um, we we switch from one from that web service to another web service, and um, I think this uh, this this testing then can easily become a lot of overkill for uh, parts of our um, system here. So, so I think I think the solution to what you're talking about is. Um, um, mocking. So there, there are uh, several in the Java world. There are several um, mock test suites. Okay. Uh, they're kind of additions onto. Um, they're they're for use inside of unit tests. So I've used Easy Mock quite a bit, okay. and it's uh, it's really nice because you can basically create uh, mock services that you train to to behave in a certain way, and then you can kind of pass it in, and, and so it becomes part of your test. Okay. And so if the services change, you change your mocks. So for, for example, when, when we're using um, external web services, we, uh, due to the asynchronous thing, we have to wait a few seconds and uh, then simulate that the web service is mm. replying what we really want to have. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, completely through the whole project, in my, my opinion. Yeah. A lot of simulation. Yeah. And it's definitely a challenge yeah. we need to overcome. Any more questions on this one. So how should we proceed with this? Should we post it to the list and, and do a, a, a voting or, yeah, or can we all just I, I, I think, agree you know, to this? Or Yeah, I, I think you know, the open source way would be to put it to the list and yeah. to vote. I think most of the active members of the community are in the room. 
Um, I, are people on board with this as a recommendation? I like this as a minimum set. Uh -huh. I'm curious if you have code formatting specifics already. Yeah, actually, I, yeah. well, it, I, I'm not so concerned with what the code formatting specifics are. I just want to choose one and be done with it. And yeah. so the one that I, I actually have in the, I actually have a, a whole um, files for setting up Eclipse so that it, it brings in all of the code formatting rules so that everyone's sharing the same code formatting rules. Um, and if people want to use different ones, I'm fine with that. But I just grabbed it from, um, from Sakai, I think. So. Exactly. Yeah. It's lazy consensus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, what we'll likely do is just say, this is what we did here. And we'll mm -hmm. uh -huh. So we put it to the list and then. Yeah, and I think we should probably put this to the list as a series of votes, you know, so yeah. code formatting, JUnit, et cetera, so people can vote on them individually. And everyone just say nothing and <laughs> we'll be done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, one, one second. One yeah. second. <laughs> okay, so I'll just, uh, to get finished with this one, I'll just touch uh, a last subject, which is uh, communication. And I'm, I'm again talking um, to developers here, so um, communication between um, developers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so what we have in place right now is the mailing list. We all know it, and most of us have used it already. Um, um, there's an IRC channel. Um, I have seen many of you already in this IRC channel. I think the IRC channel is a great place to have um, instant discussion and ad hoc discussions. Yeah, the channel that we're referring to is on Freenode. Yep. So if you're trying to connect to it, it's where to go. Yeah, we'll post all these informations. We, we should post them again yeah. on the list and uh, on the page as well. I recommend the IRC region for that. Uh, Colloquy. 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 Um, and uh, I also found uh, that um, having direct conversations with, uh, for in this case, with Josh, is a uh, is really good thing to do, because um, um, having video and everything, it, it just gives you the impression of, of being really of, of seeing each other and, and and getting every aspect of the communications. So don't only rely if you have the chance, don't only rely on on emails and mailing lists and uh, channels. Take the opportunity and, and get direct conversations if you if you need it's it's appropriate. Are we going to capture our IRC channel? Is there a way to archive that? Uh, there are bots that do archival. Does that? Yeah, that's a good idea. We I would need to get that. I would need you help know, on Tony, that. Tony um, uh, Stevenson, who is at Carrot now, one of our partners, who couldn't make it uh, to this meeting, but he actually is staff at Freenode, oh. so I'm sure that he can help us. Oh, that's with good. That. I'm sure he can. Yeah. Yeah. Michelle, did you? Yeah. So one of the things I've been working on this week is a communication plan and capturing this and other ways that we communicate. And um, so I was going to post that to the site, kind of listing each channel and mm -hmm. how to get to it, where it's archived, the description of how it's used. So I'll put that up this week for you guys to critique and include this. That's great. But I have a question because in your email, it was the IRC channel was OpenCast. Is it actually OpenCast project? No. It's OpenCast. It's OpenCast. I think it's OpenCast. OK. Just want to make so sure I'm that sorry, I got the right one listed. OK. I'll take okay. that on, on me. So and uh, once. Um, yeah. So the first one are only text based, as you all know. The second one includes um, video, and um, if you if it gets boring talking about OpenCast, uh, you might um, could you go one further? You might uh, <laughs> try out the effects. Um, it can be very funny, and it also it adds a personal note to your technical conversations. How many of you have worked on a distributed project before? So um, having been working on a distributed project for the last two years, I, I just can't stress how important communication is and how you have to build it into your thinking. So often when I'm in the middle of an iChat with somebody, we'll say, oh, wait, we need to take this to list, and we'll jump onto list. And then after we've taken it to list, we say, OK, let's capture that chat and put it on the wiki. So 
it, it just, it takes kind of day to day, moment to moment diligence. Who needs to hear about this? And I just can't stress how important it is on a distributed project. Mm -hmm. I'm getting back to this as well. Okay, great. Yeah, I, yeah I, I wanted to ask um, Vicente actually a question. Um, and so maybe, maybe we same. can share a yeah, yeah. question. But I was going to ask about the, um, the Adobe Connect um, bridge uh, the, or service that you provide. And I'm wondering if, if a few of us need to get together, yeah, sure. is that open for sure, us? Sure, sure. That's, that's uh, what I want to say <coughs> is, uh, well, that room that we are using now only Fridays, uh, it's open 24 hours a day. Uh, it, uh, even we can change the layout if you prefer for maybe bigger video or, or smaller video and more uh, room for share, sharing uh, your desktops. Uh, it, you can record, maybe we can, well, only the, um, the host or the administrator could record, but we can um, prepare more administrators' account, so mm -hmm. some of us uh, can, can trigger the, the recording facilities, so uh, well, we will be very pleased to, to oh. if you use it. That's of course. Fantastic. That's good news, because, yeah. Thank you. because Skype and, and, uh, and iChat, they, they get to the limits once more than three persons. Yeah. Um, three people are included. So um, last but not least, I want to touch on uh, two other um, forms of communication. These, these communications are um, one way, so they are only you tell others and maybe they, they do read it or they don't. Um, there's a thing called Planet Planet, which uh, basically is an aggregation, as far as I know, of, uh, of blogs. So if you happen to, to uh, have a blog, and uh, so you're invited to write about OpenCast and write about your work on Matterhorn, tag your uh, entries accordingly. Um, OpenCast project and Matterhorn would be the obvious candidates for, for tags. And we'll very soon set up um, a site, a web page, which uh, will aggregate all these, all these posts from the various sites. <coughs> Last but not least, there's a new form of communication called Twitter. Um, in the beginning, in the beginning, I thought this is for kids uh, <laughs> and uh, people that, that have too much time at their hands. Um, but right now, as you can see, um, well, it's yeah, it's you, you might think about it um, your way, but there are very interesting um, pointers you can get from these uh, tweets. Uh, for example, you see there Bertrand de la Creta. It was the guy we were talking about before from Day Interactive. He's working on, on the Jackrabbit and Sling project at Apache. And uh, every day he sends out interesting URLs and reads um, around his subject. So if you happen to stumble across, I don't know, an interesting article on media or, or, or whatever, just post a tweet, uh, maybe include um, these keywords, Opencast project and or Matterhorn, because you can send uh, within the tweets on the tweet timeline. <laughs> Thank you. And if you if if you're in yeah, if you want to know when Josh is walking his dog, uh, just try be a follow for, follower. I, I, I've been tweeting for you know three days or something now, so I still don't quite yeah. know what belongs on there and what yeah. doesn't. Just what I wanted to ask, what I wanted to to say here: don't underestimate Twitter. It's a nice toy, but it can also be useful in spreading information. It's another channel to be to use. Yeah. I'm coming to this in, on the next slide, I guess. So there are a few rules to choosing the, the communication channel. Um, the first rule is no decision making outside of the mailing list. So we have voted in September, October, was it October? Yeah. That we were using, September, that we were using the mailing list as our decision making tools. So don't use iChat, don't use um, the IRC channel to do um, decisions. If you do make decisions, or make decisions on these uh, mediums, put it onto the list um, open for voting. Um, other than that, I would say use whatever you're comfortable with. Use as many communication channels as you, as you like. The more the better, I would say. Don't spend too much time on only communication. But, uh, and there's a channel for every purpose. So if, if I'm, I'm coming along an interesting read, I would maybe use Twitter. If I'm, uh, if Josh is trying to to map 
uh, media bundles to, to the JCR repository. Maybe this is worth a blog post. Mm -hmm. Who knows? I just wanted to say that I think it would be very useful if the OpenCast webpage uh, kind of provided concise links to each one of everybody's communication channels if they're yeah. using it. This is so the, the purpose of this Planet Planet thing. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I don't know if you can aggregate in there Twitter, blogs, mm -hmm. um, uh, Macromedia Connect, or sorry, Adobe yeah. Connect. Right. Yeah. Anything it, that is RSS enabled. So I don't know. I don't know. Is Twitter available via RSS? Pretty sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we should be able to bring that in as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or at least list the, the contact details so that mm -hmm. the Twitter account, if people are comfortable with, with this. You can also protect your updates so you can, it's on an invite only basis. Yeah. And I'm, I actually I'm, did that after Lonely Girl tried to <laughs> become my <laughs> friend on Twitter or <laughs> So yeah. I learned that, yeah. So I didn't think that she was part of the OpenCast project, so I turned that on. So I think if, if, <laughs> if there are no more questions on this, um, just start right away, start communicating, and start what, to tell others what you are thinking, not only on the list, but it's, it's publicity for, for the whole project. And um, not everybody is, is uh, comfortable with every form of communication. So you will, if you're only using one channel, you will be excluding people by design. Should we have an official Facebook group for OpenCast? I was thinking about that. Mm. We, should. we should. Yeah. Why don't you open one? I'll do that right now. Good. <laughs> <laughs> He's working on that. <laughs> I wanted to do it last night. Actually, after he set yeah. it up, He's, uh, it's already there. <laughs> okay. So I think we, we should now proceed with the workshop. Well. So yeah, I, I actually had a question for Adam. I know that um, you wanted to get into some of the um, the front end technologies. So I don't know if we, I, how, what, time, what time is it? Quarter to 12. So we only have 15. Okay, so we only have 15 minutes. Do people want to try to download, run the OSGI environment and, and play with that and have some people who can help you? Do we want to have the discussion right now about Flash versus, a, versus JavaScript? Um, what, what's more this is <laughs> appropriate? Applications. Oh. Where's the mic? Yeah, I don't know. Oh. Thanks. I think uh, one of the questions that Marcus brought up yesterday, which I thought was really pertinent, was um, do uh, how much of uh, how much of the uh, user-facing applications does the uh, the uh, how much does that have to persist itself versus using the services in Matterhorn? What kind of services do you intend for the user-facing applications to use versus them dealing with this stuff themselves? I would say that user-facing applications don't persist anything. I think that's really important. Uh, where it gets persisted is, a, is an open question. You know, we may need services specifically for that feature, bookmarking and you know, tagging, annotating. All of that is going to need persistence somewhere. Whether we put that into the repository, where, whether we put that somewhere else is an open question. Yeah. That's that's one of one of the points when you when you think about what the UK is doing in the Google project. Uh, it's somehow related to what we are doing here, but they might be really using just components from what we've built here, mm -hmm. and so we could also just use components from what they are building. And if we couple if we couple the the things really really close together, then people or other projects are not really uh, are just not have the ability to to, to use components mm. from our system and include them in, in, in there. But yeah, so what you're getting at basically is the dependency graph, yeah, right? And and that's one of the reasons that we're using Maven so that we can see explicitly in the code base there's an XML file that defines when you use this component, you need these others. And if it becomes part of our functional or non-functional requirements to say, that this component must not have dependencies on anything else, then that's how we build it. So Adam, how do we proceed? What do you think? I think, um, I think we have lunch coming up, so. Should we break for lunch? And um, I, I don't know if we've got. Yes. 
Sure, that sounds good. We could we could uh, put it up right now. Yeah. Uh, well, to start, you need Subversion, Java, Maven. Okay, so maybe grab Maven first and then do a checkout from, I think that the URLs are in the source for it. Ah, so we need usernames, yes. So currently, I guess the other thing you could do is you could check out the SourceForge project because that doesn't require authentication to, lo to do a checkout. Right now, that's one of the problems that we have with our, uh, our local OpenCast version repository is that it's not open to the public yet, which is a bug. Um, I believe so. It's in the mailing list. I, I sent an email about it earlier. I can uh, I can send it around again. Is it okay for you to send it around? Yeah, feel free to check it out from SourceForge. That's fine. Just know that that's like a dead branch. Basically, it's not gonna. Nobody's gonna be committing to that anymore. So, but yeah, that should should work. Um, the only other issue is I can send you a patch. It currently, in order to run it, it's um, I think it's set up by default to use MySQL. So it means you need to have a running MySQL. So the version that I've got on my laptop, which I can't commit yet to, <laughs> to OpenCastProject.org, um, is uh, it runs on Derby, so you don't have to configure it. So. Okay, let's uh, let's break for lunch then.